This special story is presented by Hemp's and Acast Creative. Hey, everybody's been hearing us talk about the Hemp's Beauty Actives line of body lotions. This month, though, I'm really aligned with Hemp's because we always talk here on the pod about beauty sleep. I'm sure you've heard us go on at the end of the podcast about beauty sleep. And we ask all our guests, like, how do you wind down at the end of the day? This has been fitting very well into my whole wind down ritual because Hemp's has a lavender and chamomile version of their Beauty Actives body lotion. And there's nothing more wind down for me than lavender at the end of the day. And then of course, there's the hemp seed oil. So I'm moisturizing at the same time. At the end of the day, I take a shower. I too am a night shower. And then I go into my closet and I put some lotion on. And then I just kind of crawl into my bed. I, you know, you know I love a little pillow spray too. Oh, that's And nice. I just kind of melt. So this, my wind down ritual is very, very important to me. I will tell you this also right now, Eric and I are redoing our bathroom and I wanted to get a towel warmer. Like have you ever had a towel warmer at a hotel or a spa and it's like the greatest thing ever? Oh, it's the greatest. At the Manny Petty place, they have them. Yes, but not relaxing is the fact that the electric can't be run to that side of the room. So I can't have my towel warmer. But so what I've been doing instead is I'm being very intentional about this. I put the towel in the dryer when I get in the shower so that when I get out of the shower, I have like a warm towel. So I feel like I'm getting that spa moment. You combine that with the lavender and chamomile. Are you kidding me? That's a spa, more or less. That's the best we're going to do, right? Oh my God, I do the same thing and also try it with your comfiest socks, especially if it's like cold outside. Oh, nice. Okay. Another thing I really love about this lotion is I find, you know, in the past, I've tried like lots of different, you know, spa-like products, but very few of them, if any, have any like real actives in them. They're not really doing anything, which is fine. They're just kind of making you like comforted, calm, sleepy, great. This actually does something with the retinol alternative. That's right. So it's not just the lavender and chamomile. The Beauty Actives has a bakuchiol. It's like smoothing, retexturizing, help your body skin look as good as your face skin. I mean, that's going to put me to bed and happy because I'm relaxing because my skin's going to look better and it's all in one because I don't want to do more than one step of beauty at the end of the day when I'm trying to wind down. How about you? No, one and done. One and done. So the Hemp's Beauty Actives line, including the lavender and chamomile body moisturizer with retinol alternative that we were just talking about, is available at all your favorite beauty retailers. You can also go to hemp's.com, that's H-E-M-P-Z.com, to check out the whole line. They have so many scent varieties beyond the ones we just mentioned. And if you use the code Fat Mascara, you're going to get 20% off your first order at hemps.com. That's H E M P Z.com. With the code Fat Mascara, you're going to get 20% off. That's valid on all regular price merchandise. 20% off with the code Fat Mascara at hemps.com. Thank you for listening to the story brought to you in partnership with Hemps and Acast Creative. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fat Mascara Beauty Podcast. I'm Jen. Sul- I'm Jennifer Aaron Goldstein Sullivan. Ooh, That's right. fancy, fancy. I'm Jessica Beth Matlin. Ooh, I forget sometimes that your middle name is Beth. It's not short for Elizabeth, even. No, it's just Beth. Jessica Beth. Beth. Jessica Beth. I just picture you like in Sweet Valley High, Jessica Beth. Oh, because it sounds very. Like, I don't know. It's cute. And sweet like belly 80s. high. I love it. Yeah. It, it is very 1980s. We are your intrepid beauty hosts. You know what it is. It's Friday. It's time for a beauty expert. It's time for an interview. It's time to get real. It's time to talk about <laughs> what are we talking about? What's your interview? What's going I'm, on? I am so excited to introduce you to Leslie Hall from Iced Media. So, unless you like live under a rock, you realize that. Every single person is getting their beauty news from social media. And Fat Mascara podcast. And Fat Mascara yes. podcast. Are so, they're social. It's a, so, yeah, 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 yeah. A modern technology. Yeah. yeah. Beauty news and like beauty purchasing is completely upended by social, TikTok, Instagram. And really, Leslie Hall, and she's the CEO of Ice Media, which we'll talk about in a second, is really the expert at that, social selling, social media, and, you know, basically beauty and social media. So she will do a much better job at explaining all of that. And through Ice Media, she really made this agency and it really helps grow, build beauty brands throughout the world. What she does, and she'll explain it much better, is like make stars out of beauty products. So she can find a brand, help them zero in on the product, why it's fabulous, and help a brand 
become kind of like a celebrity on social. <gasps> this is like behind the scenes. You're going to find out how, like, how the magic gets made. Like, how come I mm-hmm. see that 2% lotion everywhere on my feed? Exactly. Leslie, Leslie's got her fingers in that. Yeah, like, have you ever mentioned a brand to somebody on social? Or it suddenly, yeah, exactly. Why does a brand just keep on popping up over and over again? Or how come a brand is only famous on social? So I ask her all these questions. She's worked with brands as varied as, like, L'Oreal to Drew Barrymore's Flower to SkinCeuticals to Vuitton. She's just a genius at this, and she's so passionate, and she's great not just at numbers, but she's also just great at, like, intuition and knowing everything from mass to luxury. She is so brilliant. I love her. She's a CW small business mentor, a donor and mentor at Black Girl Ventures, a member at the Brain Trust Founder Studio, and a member of the Shorty Awards Real-Time Academy. She lives in suburban New Jersey, and she is also a mom of two boys. So I have spoken enough about Leslie. I'm going to let her take it away. Leslie, thank you so much for coming. I'm so happy you're here. You have no idea. I've been looking forward to this all week long. Thank you for coming. This is a dream for me, Jess. As a longtime listener of the show, I feel like I have been preparing for today for the past several years. Oh, thank you so much. This That's so flattering. That makes you feel so good. Okay, so... Let me back up. I thought about you and I thought about like this moment because I had this conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago. I was at a party for Linda Wells, her online sort of magazine. It's an online magazine now, I guess, whatever you call it, online title, Look. It's with, um, part of Airmail. And a friend said to me, he's like, look, around, look at this moment. He's been around for a little bit. And he's like, we're celebrating like a new sort of beauty magazine. It's long form beauty writing. It's like you would say it's where beauty content lives, but it's not really about like beauty products. It's like a new sort of beauty magazine, right? Because where do people learn about beauty products now? You couldn't do a beauty magazine anymore. There's not going to be an allure physical magazine anymore because we know that that's bye-bye. He said, people learn about beauty products through social media. They learn about them through paid media, advertising, influencers, TikTok. You know, Linda Wells couldn't do Allure Magazine 2.0. She's doing something different now. Everybody learns about beauty products through their phones, and they're not mad at it through paid media. And I was like, well, I'm talking to Leslie Hall about this, so comments? It's true. Beauty shoppers really do, and, and this is objective, right? Beauty shoppers find out about new products and services through social media. Sometimes it's paid. Oftentimes it's through a creator. And whether or not it's paid, whether or not it's through advertising, whether or not it's through a creator, I would argue that the beauty consumer, the beauty shopper, has more power now than ever before. At their fingertips, they have transparency, they have visibility, they can go to Amazon and see tens of thousands of ratings and reviews, they can go to EWG and see toxicity ratings, they can go to YouTube and see reviews of products, they can go to Flip and see people with the same complexion or hair texture or skin type as them and see product ratings. So they're not looking for this like total omniscient, like this top-down title telling them this is the thing to read. This is the one place, you know, they're not looking for one title or there wasn't just one title, but they're not looking to like a beauty Bible, so to speak, to tell them what to buy. Certainly there are still authorities. There are still trusted voices. There are still communities where people look for expertise. Mm Mm-hmm. And brands, clients like mine can look for creators, can look for dermatologists, can look for professional hairstylists that align with their brand values, that are great voices to help tell the story of their brand or their product. But ultimately, if a consumer is savvy, which in today's climate, we're seeing they're more and more savvy than ever, 
and they want that second opinion. They want to find out what real consumers are saying. There's pretty much unlimited areas that they can go online to see that transparency, that visibility. So you mentioned that there's a lot of trusted authorities is not necessarily the one authority, that there's no shortage of authorities out there. But is it harder now that there are so many different types of authorities? Is it harder for brands to find, like I'm thinking of the landscape and I'm thinking of a bunch of mini authorities. You've got derms, you've got influencers. I'm a mom now and I know you're a mom too. You know how there's so many different like mom influencers and some of them are quite good, but some of them are like, I can pick up a phone today and decide I'm a mom influencer. Nobody's stopping me. Should I be a mom influencer? I don't know. We can we can decide that like offline. <laughs> but like, is it harder for brands to decide who to align with? You're in some really interesting conversations. That's such a great question. Meta actually did a study not that long ago, Meta being the parent company of Facebook and Instagram. And it was so fascinating beauty shoppers said that they were just about as likely to purchase a new product from a nano influencer defined as an influencer with less than 10,000 followers as they were an influencer that would be called a mega influencer over 1 million followers. Wow. So... Really what they're saying is the amount of followers is not going to influence them more when it comes to that person's ability to help them decide which products and services in the beauty category should help them make a choice. So to answer your question, we're in an era now where... You're absolutely right. Anyone can be an authority. Brands have no shortage in terms of the places they can go to what we would call co-create content. And one of the things that really does for clients like mine or what we would call indie brands that don't necessarily have these big budgets like some of those larger, more established brands is it levels the playing field, right? It allows some of these upstart brands to really create compelling content, get out there and get in front of consumers and understand that they have great potential to influence those consumers to make purchases in a way that historically would have been a lot harder for them. Are some of the beauty brands going, you know, you got me thinking when when we're talking about like going with the smaller influencers and I mentioned, I, just, I was just joking around, like, like you know, a um, mom influencer kind of thing, but are some of the beauty brands that you work with going outside of the beauty space. So it's very easy and natural fit to think like, I'm a beauty brand. I'm going to go for a beauty editor or beauty influencer. But are they going into like, I think of my mom friends, my mom colleagues, mom peeps, (laughs) they will learn about beauty products sometimes from a mom influencer. Or maybe I've seen like people in like the cooking space talk about a nail polish or a cleaning person, a clean talk person talk about, they'll go off off to the side and they'll talk about some kind of beauty product or it, are they going kind of laterally? Absolutely. For a brand and, you know, there's, we could have a, a whole episode, right? Just about kind of creators and, and creator content and creator strategy. I think first and foremost, the majority of brands that we see in the space are really doing it wrong, right? They're thinking about creators as what I'll call fast followers, right? Kind of checking the box with creators. Mm. But I think they're not really thinking about creators as a profit center. They're not thinking about creators through the lens of real business strategy. And they're not thinking about the creators in terms of how that's going to help them grow their business. I'll give you a great example that I think really speaks to this idea of maybe going outside of the, the traditional approach. So one of my clients is Moroccan oil. And during COVID, they were launching a jumbo dry shampoo. And I run six, seven days a week. So when I think about one of the best benefits of dry shampoo, 
I can go longer without having to wash my hair, right? So as a runner, as an athlete, as someone that's super into fitness, dry shampoo should be a staple in my beauty regimen. So during COVID, they were launching this product. Well, who better to tell that story than a Peloton instructor? So we went out to three Peloton instructors, Jess King and Leanne and and Ben, and we had them tell the story of this jumbo dry shampoo product through the lens of they're teaching multiple classes a day. They don't want to have to wash their hair every time they teach a class. And we created that content, but it was really optimized for a social media advertisement so that we could drive those ads to Moroccan Oil's e-commerce website and target the followers of those creators, understanding that those were probably the people taking those classes. And it was a phenomenally successful campaign that drove real business results for that brand. And and obviously those creators were not your traditional beauty influencers. So I think it's just one example of how you can be really thoughtful about the right partners to tell the right story of that particular product without necessarily falling back on those same beauty creators that oftentimes brands are going to time and time again to check that box. But okay, when did things, let's like baby step it. Okay, so when did paid social get really big? Because at first it was just like pure social media, right? That's when like Instagram just came out. Nobody was doing paid. And then there was paid social. Can you just break down? I'm going to really baby step it back. What is paid social in, in through a beauty lens? Yeah. And and that's a great question. And it, it actually goes back much further than that, right? I've had my company for 20 years. And you're like uh, way before Instagram. <laughs> you're like, yeah. I, I mean, I remember doing some of the the first conversion ads on Facebook a really long time ago, and just kind of explaining. And that's a really great question. Like, what is paid advertising? And I'll I'll explain it through the lens of recently Sephora had their semi annual sale, which a lot of people probably a lot of your listeners pay attention to, right? Because yeah. Sephora doesn't have sales that often. Perfect. Spell it like in crayon for us, okay? Like I've ne- I have no idea. I just landed from Mars. Exactly. So Sephora had their semi annual sale. I'm sure a lot of your listeners, like myself, are Sephora loyalty members, so they pay a lot of attention to that. Sephora is having their sale. And a lot of brands know that it's a great opportunity to get new customers to try their product. So some brands, and and the majority of brands, right, probably just rely on Sephora to get the word out about that sale. Mm -hmm. Maybe more ambitious brands are going to create content or even partner with creators, right, influencers, as we were just talking about, to create content, put it on social media, and either hope that it's going to have a viral moment or think, oh, well, maybe some of the brand's followers or some of the creator's followers happen to be Sephora, VIB, or Rouge status loyalty members. Our clients or the savviest brands know that the algorithms of these social media platforms, right? So I'm going to break that down. Social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, I could go on. And then algorithms, right? That's sophisticated technology jargon word that people like me in this industry use. But really, it's (laughs) the engine behind these social media platforms that decide who gets what content in their feed, the savviest brands know that these algorithms are very, very, very good at knowing who those Sephora shoppers are. So they can create that content, whether it's brand content, creator content, that has their product, that has a message calling out the Sephora sale, and guaranteeing that that piece of content is going to show up in the feed of a Sephora loyalty member during the sale 
so that they can drive that shopper to the Sephora app, in-store to Sephora during the sale, or online to Sephora.com, literally to hundreds of thousands of Sephora shoppers getting the right message to the right person at the right time. And that's the power of paid. What might that ad look like? Like, what are the kind of elements of that ad? Does it say like Sephora sale? That's such a great question. So say you are a brand like... You can make up the brand if you want to. Yeah, it could be a, a fake brand. Fake brand. Or, you know, it, it could be a real brand. You know, I, I shop at Sephora all, time, uh, all the time. And let's say it's the Ilia Tinted Serum. And okay. it's on sale. And they're trying to get some new people to discover it. So they might have some allure best-selling serum or Allure favorite um, or Allure award winner is a big one, right, on there. So they might put that stamp on the ad and right. then they might say Sephora sale and they might have the dates of the Sephora sale and then they might have a verbatim from a rating and review that a customer has left on their website. And then they would have a call to action that says go to your local Sephora during these dates or shop now at Sephora.com. Got it. Okay. That's interesting. And it's very funny that you use the Ilya example because I literally got a text message from my friend. If she's listening, she's laughing. Last week, she's not a big beauty person at all. She is not the kind of person who buys premium beauty. And she said, okay, do I need to just like make the jump and buy this Ilya serum, like skin tint? And I was like, it is good. But she was tempted, I think, probably by, I'm going to ask her, Probably by an Instagram ad. But how did they know? So it's interesting. I would say that... I'm going to ask her how she, why it came up, but is it, let's talk first. Okay. You should ask her. And I think that, I think what Ilya does really well, and it speaks to brands that understand what I'll call the hero product, right? Because mm -hmm. some brands get it and some brands don't, is... Ilya really came onto the scene, onto the map with this product that was kind of a innovation that didn't really exist in the marketplace, this idea of a tinted serum with SPF, right? I, I mean, you know so good. way more products than I do, but I can't think of another tinted serum with SPF that existed in the marketplace when that product came out. Somebody at work also asked me about it too, yeah. It's it's understanding for a new brand that wasn't a household name at the time what they deserved to be famous for. And that is the absolute number one favorite part of my job, which is getting to work with founders, executives, marketing people from brands and helping them figure that out because the majority of brands and clients that come to us can't answer that question when we start working together. And my favorite example, which I think is one of the best success stories that we're really proud of, is Paula's Choice. We started working with them in probably 2017. They had a new CEO, someone I had worked with earlier in her career. And she came to me, she said, I, you know, I just started as the CEO of Paula's Choice. And, you know, I know, Leslie, you have a lot of experience in beauty. I'd love you to kind of take a look at what the brand's been doing. Let me know what you think. And it was a real opportunity for partnership and, and collaboration and education with their brand team. One of the things that is really common sense, but oftentimes is not top of mind to sometimes people running these brands, is that in today's climate, and I think especially with social media trends and what we were talking about with discovery in social media of beauty products and services, the beauty customer is oftentimes really buying products, not buying brands. I think there have been other eras where beauty shoppers were very loyal to certain brands. And maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I would have come into your, your bathroom, Jess, and I would have opened your vanity 
and maybe you would have had four, five, or six products in any category, skincare, color, cosmetics, fragrance, and they, they all would have been from the same brand. And that's just not how beauty shoppers, for the most part, right? I don't want to make blanket statements, but for the most part, it's just not how beauty shoppers shop anymore. Why do you think that happened? I have a couple of theories, but why do you think that happened? A few reasons. There's obviously so much more choice these days. And because of that, the bar has really been raised in terms of the expectation that a brand is going to be able to have a product that can absolutely be best in the world at solving one specific need at its price point in its category. And the expectation that it's going to be able to do that across five, six, seven, ten different products would be really unbelievable to today's savvy beauty consumer. I would love to hear your thoughts, Jess. I think there's a few things. I think it's like once Sephora landed in the U.S., like the late 90s, it was like a buffet. And before you were going to one restaurant or you're going to a restaurant that had Viennese tables, you know, like, like six, now you were at the old country buffet and it was craziness. And I think the customer is now trained to be running amok. Are you saying that uh, Americans are gluttons, Jess? <laughs> <laughs> Sephora is a French company, so I don't know. But even Sephora, when it started, it was much smaller. And then it just, it's how many more brands do they have than they used than they used to have? I mean, it's it's crazy. I remember I thought the benefit catalog and the bliss catalogs were like, whoa, look how many brands they have. Oh, they I have remember few- that bliss catalog. <laughs> but now that seems it seems quaint. So that and then I think like editorially into the gloss also was it wasn't it wasn't training anyone but it was sort of revealing it was just sort of you know solidifying like okay makeup artists kind of people in the know they're not like oh I'm a Chanel girl or I'm a Bobby Brown girl it's I use all of these different things and I love this thing that you've also never heard of and you need to find this hunt down this it was kind of inspirational because everything was so different I realize that's a very kind of a niche example, but I think that there's something to it. It's funny you say it's a niche example because I remember the first time I went platinum blonde probably 10 years ago and Into the Gloss featured the Christoph Robin purple, I don't know if it was a conditioner or something, and it was like, this is the only product that you can use if you have... Pla-. And I hunted down that product like nobody's business. So that resonated with me a lot, even though you might call it a niche example. So I think you're absolutely but right. But then it's Burn Glossier, which is the most unniche thing ever. I mean, not ever, but you know what I mean. Now it's in Sephora. But I think it... I remember somebody saying, like, it's just not how people shop. How is that in context of Glossier? And now I'm, like, losing my train of thought. But... Maybe it was because, oh, they, they came out with the, their their line, their skincare line, and maybe Emily was interviewed or something, but it was like, mix it with this or whatever. And she acknowledged that's not, how, that's not how people shop. No one's going to buy one thing from the whole line. Right. People want to feel like they're curating their own mm-hmm. collection. And it's probably the single most important insight for someone running a brand to understand as they are looking to bring new people into their brand universe. Yeah. And even at Moda, like we mix products together, like in shoots and stuff, and we ask them to be comfortable with that. We, you know, we're all about curation. And and that is relatable Mm -hmm. to how every single one of your consumers or potential consumers is living in her daily life. Yeah. And then going back to the Paula's Choice example, every single one of their ads had four, five, six products in it and was going entirely to new customers and it had a big 20% off stamp on it. And the expectation that someone that was not familiar with the brand 
was going to see this ad, go to your website, research four or five or six products, figure out which one was right for them, and then make a purchase because it was on sale was entirely unrealistic. The beauty consumer, you talk about this hero product, is either going to swap out one step from their regimen with an existing product and try yours, or they're going to add an additional step that they're not already doing to try a new brand. But what they're absolutely not going to do is research which one is best. They have to believe that you are best at that one step or you are the only one that can solve that problem for them. So we sat down with Paula's Choice. We kind of audited the entire portfolio. We looked at the ratings and reviews. We looked at the top sellers. We really understood what their existing consumers trusted them for. And then we looked at the market and we looked at the white space. We looked at what other products were popular, what existed, what didn't. And around that time, the Biologique Recherche was really having a moment. And we saw that their BHA product from Paula's Choice was a top seller. And we really bet big on that. And there was tremendous momentum. And it was a big win for the brand. And what it really showed is that you can build a portfolio around a hero product. Just four years later, the brand sold to Unilever for $2 billion. And it was such a good example of how you can bring new consumers into a brand with a hero product. And once they trust you for that, you really can upsell them anything that that you put out. But it's earning that trust with that hero product that's going to build your business. Hey, everyone. It's Jen. You know, we don't do this at Fat Mascara where a sponsor sponsors part of the podcast. We should, though, because if Science Corner had a sponsor, I think it would be Living Proof, the hair company. They are the leader in scientifically proven high-performance hair care. I love that it came out of like researchers doing their science, figuring out at a molecular level how your hair works. Even their quiz online that they use to help you find like your hair styling products and your shampoos and everything. It has AI. I will allow AI in this one case because it's helping me get better hair, right? This is so you. But 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 I love Living Proof too. You know that I'm very low maintenance with hair. I took the quiz and it led me to Perfect Hair Day Dry Shampoo. I have been treating myself once in a while to a blowout. I've had a lot of events and things recently. I got a blowout on Monday. I've been using the dry shampoo. Honey, it is Friday. And I don't know if that grosses people out, but I still have a very nice blowout. You want to know why? Science. They have 120 global patents. 450 plus formulas and over 200 awards. They're SLS, SLES, paraben, phthalate free, PETA certified. You know we love that. Cruelty free, color safe. The most intense certification. The most intense. All right, save your hair from the guessing game and give it the products your hair deserves with Living Proof. Visit livingproof.com slash fat mascara and use code fat mascara to get 15% off your first purchase. That's livingproof.com slash fat mascara code fat mascara for 15% off your first purchase livingproof.com slash fat mascara. And the code is fat mascara. All right, fam, welcome to the new fat mascara obsession. When I say obsession, Jess and I are Obsessed. Like if I had a t-shirt with my Earth Breeze Eco Sheets like on it, I'd be okay with that because it has changed my life. Do you guys know when you buy laundry detergent, usually 91% of those big old jugs ends up in a landfill? We are always talking about how can we just make something smaller and better and healthier for the planet? Guess who did it? Earth Breeze Eco Sheets. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed by just everything that's going on in the world, especially the environment. What makes me feel better is when I can do something small. Even if it's small, I feel like, you know what? I'm doing my part. And I'm being serious. Earth Breeze Eco Sheets, something like that makes me feel like, well, I'm doing my part, guys. Earth Breeze Eco Sheets come in the size of like, it's like a file folder. It's not the big, nasty, gloopy, gloppy, heavy jug that you're bringing back from the drugstore. 
it doesn't, like Jen said, go in a landfill. Once you're done, you're done. And then I collapse the paper case and I recycle the case. Paper case, it's not even, it's an envelope. Yeah, it's an envelope. It's an envelope. I, I push it into my little paper recycling and I'm done without a trace. It's so easy. They offer flexible subscriptions. And just in case, whether you have HE, like the high efficiency front load, whatever kind of laundry detergent you normally use, this will work for you. Looks like a dryer sheet, but it's like a detergent sheet. And you just pop it in there. Oh my God, if you need instructions, DM one of us. But honestly, it's so, so easy. And you should switch. Get rid of the old fashioned stuff. Right now, you can subscribe to EarthBreeze and you're going to save 40%. You go to earthbreeze.com slash mascara to get started. Also, it's one of those things that you know you're going to use a ton of. You always run out. Just get yourself a subscription. It's 40% off. That's earthbreeze.com slash mascara for 40% off. Earthbreeze.com slash mascara. You will thank us. So on Fat Mascara, we always talk about sunscreen, but let's be honest, sometimes it could feel a little bit like kind of like taking your medicine. Taizo is so different. It's almost like applying a primer. It feels like a primer. You're right. And this sunscreen is amazing. It is 100% a mineral sunscreen, which is so good because it works immediately when you put it on. You don't have to put it on 15 minutes before you go in the sun like you do with chemical sunscreens. Taizo stands for titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. These are the minerals and sunscreens that are the best choice for your skin, your body, even the environment. And you're going to look forward to putting it on. Like just said, it's sort of a primer. I would say it's like, first of all, it blends into any skin tone. It has like a peachy beige color to it, the one that I use particularly, but it gives a nice slip and a little bit of a blurring quality. So you're putting on your sunscreen, you know you're going to be protecting yourself from all those signs of aging, but you're also perfecting your skin in the process, which is so nice. Also, Taizo products are cruelty-free, reef safer, free of parabens, gluten, fragrances, dye, phthalates, if that's important to you. Taizo is the sunscreen you're going to want to get, not just for summer, right now. Right now you should be wearing sunscreen. Go to TaizoSkin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order. That's TaizoSkin.com, T-I-Z-O Skin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 for 15% off your entire order. That is fascinating. All right. I wanted to ask you about something that I would call just kind of in a, in a blanket term, Instagram brands. These are brands that just sort of, I guess a more technical term might be a D DTC brand, but they just sort of kind of happened, I feel like in the past five years, these brands just sort of mushroom out of nowhere. They're really cute. They have great packaging. There's usually somebody cute advertising it. There's a dot on it where if I poke it, the price pops up. I can buy it right then and there. They just sort of appear and appear and appear on my feed. Yes. What are these Instagram brands? Instagram brands. So there, there's a few things there to unpack. So we'll do that. <laughs> I love that term, unpack. Unpack it with me, Leslie. We'll, we'll unpack that. So it's funny, right? Because at first you, you say Instagram brand, and I, and I kind of think of like a social first brand, right? Which is something we, okay. talk, oh. we, we talk a lot about at the agency. And, and when I think of a social first brand or like an Instagram brand, I, I kind of more think of like Elf, which is much more established brand. And, and I kind of think of like a brand that is really doing a great job to maximize the, the potential that exists within social media, technology, tools, partnerships and, and take big risks, big bets, and and they're paying off. And then I think when you talk about kind of these maybe more indie brands that are popping up and kind of understanding what I'll call like the power of social media and, and almost the democratization of social media, right? The ideas that there are not the same obstacles for a new brand to enter the marketplace that there once were. If you are savvy, if you understand how to maybe, you know, I hate to say like hack the algorithm, but how to enter the market using the tools and technology that exist. And, and the specific technology you're talking about is Instagram shops and, and Instagram tags that allow you to check out natively within Instagram and just a, a note on that, 
80 million credit cards in the U.S. are saved to Instagram shops, right? So with about three clicks of your finger in under 10 seconds, a beauty shopper can make an impulse buy on Instagram. So just think about that opportunity when we talk about discovering new products and services on social media. So there's a huge opportunity for, I'll call indie brands, founder-led brands, entry-level brands that want to take advantage of this leveled playing field and can be savvy and scrappy and want to kind of enter the marketplace. The challenge for them is that the consumer has really high expectations when it comes to things like product efficacy and results. So these impulse buys are real and you can get someone to test your product But when it comes to those ratings and reviews, you're going to need to be able to stand up and perform at the same level as those other products that are from those more established brands. That's tough. But but if you've got a good product, and especially if you've got a differentiated product, right, because there's a lot of saturation in beauty right now, it's a great opportunity. So what's Tell me about like a success story or one it doesn't need to be a wildly huge successful story success story, but tell me about an Instagram brand maybe that caught your eye that you thought was just impressive. I think there's a lot of interesting upstarts that we're seeing. I think I will be interested to see what Charlotte Palermino's brand, uh, Do Skin, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, mm-hmm. does. I think it's early to tell. I think some of these other TikTok influencers and Instagram influencers that are launching brands, it'll be interesting to see what they do. We've got our eyes on them. We'll see. Do you think that's kind of, you talk about like efficacy and like standing up to like the big boys. When I think of brands like that, I think of when it, when you use terms like that, I'm thinking of stuff like skincare. Do you think some of these Instagram brands would be better off doing things like color? Not that you can't like I mean color, you still have to have performance. I know we're not here to talk about like you're not a color expert. You're not a <laughs> I'm certainly not and I'm the first person no. to say what what I'm qualified to speak on and what I'm not. So I'm famous for that. You're certainly an expert at like watching what you can convince people to buy. Yeah, social first brands flop or succeed. I just wonder about how big of a swing you can take if you're a social first brand. It's one thing to put out a cute lip gloss. It's a quite another to compete with like a Paula's Choice of the world? It, it is a great question. I can tell you where I do have a lot of experience is working with founder-led brands. We work mm-hmm. with Drew Barrymore and, and Flower by Drew. We work with Taraji Henson's TPH by Taraji. In the skincare category, we work with Sierra and her skincare brand On a Mission, which is performing really, really well. Even in the hair category, Mindy McKnight, the most famous mom on YouTube. And For all of these founders and celebrities, I would say the difference between what we're seeing there and some of these other celebrities and founder-led brands is their ability to understand what we talked about earlier, the hero product, understand that it's not just their celebrity that is selling or driving the success of the brand. It is a clear product strategy. It's understanding their consumer and their consumer's needs and and what they deserve and actually have merit to put into the marketplace and what of their products can perform and can perform in the market today. And some of the other celebrity and founder-led brands as you and Jen have spoke extensively about, the listeners know, are not able to compete in this marketplace because of that. And we've seen some of those brands sunset. My prediction is we're going to see more of those brands that just don't have what it takes to compete in today's climate. Whereas maybe a few years ago, they 
would have been able to. The word sunset always makes me sad. I'm going to sunset that. It's a nice way of saying goodbye. It's not a happy thing. Okay. <laughs> all right. So let's move on. God, so I could talk to you all day. Can you tell that I find this stuff interesting? If, 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 if I had my way, we'd still be on the first question and I'd still be talking to you about mom influencers. <laughs> Does a brand founder have to be a social animal to succeed today? Do they themselves have to be very outward facing? Well, we talked about some of the founder led brands and yeah. <laughs> the sad sunsetting of some of those founder led brands. So, you know, certainly you and Jen have reported on a lot of those founder led brands that have mm-hmm. not made the cut. So, I would argue that certainly social media followers does not a beauty brand make. Absolutely the founder does not have to have a lot of followers, but we have seen in some instances where that has helped get the brand that visibility, but I don't believe it's a requirement, no. Okay. What do you think? Do you you think it's a requirement? I don't think it's a requirement because like sometimes you go on a, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, which is not right, but like you'll go onto a brand and then you'll like, look to see who the founder is and be like 4,000 followers. And it's like, oh, that seems disproportionate, like successful brand. Does it make, does it make you trust the brand less? Not at all. I don't think somebody needs to be like a showman to have a successful brand. And yeah, I don't think being tremendously popular does not make me trust the brand more. In fact, I can think of a brand where a big personality, not be, it's not because they have a big personality makes me trust the brand less. It's not like one thing is a is the cause of making me distrust the brand, but a big personality does not make me trust the brand. Do you know what I mean? Like their personality does not make me trust the brand, but they have like tons of followers. It doesn't, they're not related. Yeah. It's funny. I think because of social media, everyone feels like they need to now be both like a a forward facing personality and also be talented. I was talking to a makeup artist the other day and she was like, she showed me like, she just wanted to show me something on her Instagram and she said, I know I don't have a lot of followers. And I was like, it's okay. She's like, I know I need more. She's like, I just miss when I could just do my job. But now she feels compelled. She feels like that's part of the job. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of those professionals, that has become part of the job. For the ones that do it well, oftentimes it does lead to those brand deals or product deals, endorsements, creator partnerships, and it can be quite lucrative for them. Okay. We're about to, we're going to be sunsetting this podcast soon as much as I don't want to. So just another question or two before our lightning round. Let's do it. Is there a way to get some deal hacks? You seem to know the inside tricks. I'm going to get in trouble for this one, but... I want your listeners to have all the information. So let's do it. Facebook and Instagram. Several years back, there were some controversies and they decided that they were going to create a public archive, not an archive, but a a public database, a searchable website of every single advertisement from every single brand that was active in real time so that you would be able to search any brand and see every single one of their ads that was live. So there's no historical ads. So if there's a particular brand and you want to see if they have any ads that are running and potentially any ads that they are running that might indicate that there is a sale or an offer or a coupon code, you can go to this ads library is what it's called, and you can search that brand and you will see if they are having a sale. You can also search any retailer. So if you know all of the places where that brand is sold, Or if you don't necessarily know what particular brand or product you're looking for, 
And there's just certain places you like to shop for beauty products like Ulta or Blue Mercury, and you want to see if they have a current sale or offer or coupon code. They're likely to be advertising it on Facebook or Instagram. You can search there as well. And then TikTok also has a creative center. The difference is that you cannot search TikTok's creative center by brand or retailer the way you can on Meta. But with TikTok's creative center, you can search by category and you can still see some live ads there. The other difference with TikTok is that brands need to opt in and give permission to be searchable, whereas on Meta, 100% of those ads are available. And Maybe, Jess, we could put those links in the show notes and all of the listeners can click on those links and search for their favorite brands and their favorite categories and find some deals. Excellent. That's a very handy advice. And Leslie, can you name a few products, let's talk about products that you're obsessed with right now. My number one favorite beauty product, I think hero products are definitely a theme for me too. My number one beauty product is Lumify Eye Drops. I once heard an influencer say they give you doll eyes, and I think that's the best analogy I can think of. They just make your eyes super big and white, and I've never seen another product that can do that. And I don't think they advertise, but I would love to work with them. And then I think the other products that I love really just are ones that help me because of my workout routine. So the Moroccan oil dry shampoo, I think I spoke about it in one of the examples. It's the biggest staple in my regimen. They have one for light hair and I don't wash my hair very often because I run every day and it's just too much. So I use that all the time. Also hair related because I don't wash my hair very often, I think I already said that, is Fakai has this apple cider detox scrub, and it's a pre-wash, so I love that it's that extra step, but the smell is the best thing ever, and if you use it, I use it about once a week, but the difference it makes in the texture and volume is kind of unbelievable. And then actually this one product, I really love a bar soap, So don't Mm -hmm. judge me for that. So I go back and forth between the Kanuka with CBD, which I think really helps with my running and my muscles. And then another one that I actually got on Moda Operandi because I've really been enjoying shopping the hidden gems is the Santa Maria Novella Bar Soap Ah, that I really like there. Their bar soap's great. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, let's go to do our Fat Mascara 5. Quick easy, simple. No pressure. All right. What is your favorite sneaky snack? My favorite sneaky snack, I go to Colombia all the time, the country, and there's a fruit there that I have never seen anywhere else in the world, especially not in America. I can't get it here. And the people that know me know this because I talk about it all the time. Yes, I'm obsessed with it. It's called a granadilla. I actually don't think there's an English word for the fruit because you can't get it here. It has a very hard skin and then you open it up and it looks kind of like little slimy seeds, but it is the best, best thing ever in the world. I'm obsessed with them. I eat like a dozen of them at a time, but it's a granadilla and people should Google it. It's the best thing ever. Who's one of your favorite people to follow on social? My son, Jordan. He's 15. Does he like that you follow him? Or is he like, please stop looking at my social? He's pretty good about it. Do you comment on his stuff? All the time. What does he post? He's a big surfer. So he he posts his surfing videos and sometimes pictures with him and his friends. It's really fascinating, actually. I learn so much about Gen Z and how teenagers use social media from him. And one of the things that's so fascinating to me is just this, how they use Instagram, the posting photos and deleting them. It's really fascinating to me. And what he explains is, yes, that's how you're supposed to use Instagram. So he put me onto that. I'm still not posting and deleting my feed photos, but 
Apparently that's how you're- Wait, su- like static photos? Static photos. You're supposed to post them, leave them up for a couple of days and then delete them. Really? Yes. Ask a teen. <laughs> Does he think it's lame that you leave yours up or is it just like your behavior and he has his behavior? He has not explicitly said it's lame. I'm pretty sure if I asked him, the answer would be yes. All right. What would you do if you were not doing this? I would love to do something more creative or in the arts. I used to think maybe an interior designer, but I don't think I actually have the talent. I think I really love to look at beautiful things, but I don't think I have the skill set to create them. I don't think that's true. Okay. Best advice someone ever gave you? Don't look for other people to solve your problems. Who gave you that? A mentor of mine who is a very successful businessman. And I think I've had a good amount of adversity as a lot of people have, and certainly a lot of entrepreneurs And he's helped me navigate some of the bigger challenges I've had with my business and has been very good at being direct and said, don't look for other people to solve your problems. And he's right. Were you pissed when he said that? Or were you like, thanks, I like that? I wasn't pissed. Or taken aback. Unexpected, yes. But I I appreciate people who, I'm a very direct person. I appreciate direct people. And I far prefer people who are brutally honest than someone who's going to tell me what I want to hear. And finally, I'm throwing a new one into the mix. What's your favorite quote? Oh, this is a good one because I say it all the time and the people around me are so sick of hearing it. But it's the 13th century poet Rumi, and Mm -hmm. it's from a, a longer poem. But the universe is rigged in your favor. And I say it all the time, but the really the takeaway from the poem is that I think we're constantly surrounded by all of these distractions and we always think, oh, we want this next thing and all of these external pleasures are going to make us happy, but really everything we need is within us and the universe is indeed rigged in our favor if we just pay attention. I'm going to sit on that too. I love it. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Jess. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product review or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at fatmascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. The special story is presented by Hemp's and Acast Creative. Hey, everybody's been hearing us talk about the Hemp's Beauty Actives line of body lotions. This month, though, I'm really aligned with Hemp's because we always talk here on the pod about beauty sleep. I'm sure you've heard us go on at the end of the podcast about beauty sleep. And we ask all our guests like, how do you wind down at the end of the day? This has been fitting very well into my whole wind down ritual because Hemp's has a lavender and chamomile version of their Beauty Actives body lotion. And there's nothing more wind down for me than lavender at the end of the day. And then of course, there's the hemp seed oil. So I'm moisturizing at the same time. At the end of the day, I take a shower. I too am a night shower. And then I go into my closet and I put some lotion on and then I just kind of crawl into my bed. I, you know, you know I love a little pillow spray too. Oh, that's And nice. I just kind of melt. So this, my wind down ritual is very, very important to me. I will tell you this also right now, Eric and I are redoing our bathroom and I wanted to get a towel warmer. Like have you ever had a towel warmer at a hotel or a spa and it's like the greatest thing ever? Oh, it's the greatest. At the Manny Petty place, they have them. Yes, but not relaxing is the fact that the electric can't be run to that side of the room. So I can't have my towel warmer. But so what I've been doing instead is I'm being very intentional about this. I put the towel in the dryer when I get in the shower so that when I get out of the shower, I have like a warm towel. So I feel like I'm getting that spa moment. You combine that with the lavender and chamomile. Are you kidding me? That's a spa, more or less. That's the best we're going to do, right? Oh my God, I do the same thing and also try it with your comfiest socks, especially if it's like cold outside. Oh, nice. Okay. Another thing I really love about this lotion is I find, you know, in the past, 
I've tried like lots of different, you know, spa like products, but very few of them, if any, have any like real actives in them. They're not really doing anything, which is fine. They're just kind of making you like comforted, calm, sleepy, great. This actually does something with the retinol alternative. That's right. So it's not just the lavender and chamomile. The Beauty Actives has a Pacuchiol. It's like smoothing, retexturizing, help your body skin look as good as your face skin. I mean, that's going to put me to bed and happy because I'm relaxing because my skin's going to look better and it's all in one because I don't want to do more than one step of beauty at the end of the day when I'm trying to wind down. How about you? No, one and done. One and done. So the Hemp's Beauty Actives line, including the lavender and chamomile body moisturizer with retinol alternative that we were just talking about, is available at all your favorite beauty retailers. You can also go to hemps.com, that's H-E-M-P-Z.com, to check out the whole line. They have so many scent varieties beyond the ones we just mentioned. And if you use the code FATMASCARA, you're going to get 20% off your first order at hemps.com. That's H-E-M-P-Z.com. With the code FATMASCARA, you're going to get 20% off. That's valid on all regular price merchandise. 20% off with the code FATMASCARA at hemps.com. Thank you for listening to the story brought to you in partnership with Hemps and Acast Creative.